this is about John Ridge, a gimlet forger who worked at the same trade for 75 years of his life. Ecclesfield is a northern suburb of Sheffield, but John Ridge was a, an Ecclesfielder, not a Sheffielder. And he worked next door to the Ball Inn in the Wallet end of Ecclesfield uh, in a tiny workshop, of which there must have been typical of hundreds of these things at one time. And tragically, the place was pulled down to build a, a garage on it. Here you see John at work forging gimlets. A gimlet's a, a tool for making small holes in wood, typically two to six millimetres diameter, and people would use them for making holes for screws and putting uh, small holes through pieces of wood for whatever reason. Nowadays, of course, most people buy a quite an expensive electric drill to do the same job. Here he is bossing the tool, the gimlet, which is making it from a round section into a half round section at the end. And now he's twisting it. And he straightens that twist with his hammer. So the whole thing becomes truly straight. And then he puts a nose on the tool, which eventually will have a screw point filed on it. Eventually, the gimlet has a, a head or a handle uh, across it. We start off with the mould, that's the piece of straight steel. He tangs it by making one end tapered, then he bosses it, he twists it, straightens it and puts a nose on it. And that is the series of operations that John does. Eventually uh, the tools go to be filed and ground and have the handle fitted. Here we see in slow motion John actually at work. And if you count the number of twists on every gimlet that he produces and the number of blows with the hammer, you will find that they are all identical. The reason being that if he could hit it once less, he would do. But there is a required number of blows to produce that tool. And you will find that every one, they are just like peas in a pod. Here is the box uh, that has all his little bosses uh, or tools that fit into the anvil that are produced first before he can actually make whatever product he's on with. John was 84 at this time and uh, this shows his hammer made of ash, a very hard wood and he could wear a hammer out within five years. The operation is to boss the tool, that's to make it half round, for him to twist it and then to straighten that twist by blows of the hammer. And of course as he's hammering it, his left hand holding it is twisting it round so that he gets the hammer in exactly the right position and then he noses it by putting the conical nose on. And here again we have the series of operations, just to remind you. The people he worked for in Sheffield, the, ma the major manufacturers, used to send John steel out that was cut up into short lengths so that he could then actually do the actual forging process and they were eventually taken back to Sheffield to be ground and to have the nose filed on that's the little screw part at the front that pulls the gimlet into the wood he would that would be done by a bit filer and uh, eventually the gimlet head or handle would be fitted uh, and then taken to the warehouse for sending out to the shop or whatever Mr. Sorby, scissor forger. This was taken on a hot day, bright sunshine outside, uh, pictures uh, dark as pitch inside, 
very difficult to photograph. Um, here we see Mr. Sorby producing surgical scissors. The process was done in the 60s still for the production of small runs of scissors for surgical use. Here we see him punching a hole through the steel. The, the hole eventually will be the formation of the bow where one's thumb goes through. Another part of the process is in swaging down the shank of the scissor. That's the part between the blade and the bow. And here we see him cutting the joint. That is the angle of about 45 degrees, uh, where the two halves of the blades come together, um, is actually formed uh, by holding the steel at that angle on the edge of a tool, on the anvil. You'll see that nothing's measured in this. Everything's done by eye. There may be the odd chalk mark somewhere or other that he just sees. This is a very interesting operation. This is opening out the bow of the scissor in order to make the part where you th one's thumb goes through. The tool that is hammering on is called a bowing stiddy. And you can see him working on this and gradually opening the steel out till it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And eventually it will form the shape big enough for the th fingers to go through. First of all, we start off with the mood, which is the blank of steel. Stainless steel is very hard to forge. Then they punch the hole in the end for the bow and reduce the shank. Then they cut the joint there and then the blade is smithed. In other words, additional work is done to spread the blade wider in its width. Then work is done on the bow to open the bow up on the inside bowing study and it is finished off to, to size on the outside bowing study which then is virtually finished as far as the forger is concerned except that scissors of course are always in pairs and he, if he were making say a dozen pair of scissors he would make 24 blades and at the point when he'd made all those blades he would then start to pair them together and uh, this is the process we're looking at now where he is straightening slightly cold the shank of the scissor making sure they're perfectly straight and he will find two blades that match exactly and from then on they become a pair of scissors they keep together forever Bob Pryor was making the iron or cutter for a spoke shave. A spoke shave's a tool, something like a small plane um, or a handle about 10 inches long uh, in which a cutter is fitted by means of two tapered ends called tangs. And the process of making the cutter for the, the iron, as we call it, is to get a bar of steel and firstly forge it in the centre to create a cutting edge. After that, the piece of steel is cut off from the bar and this operation is done several times because in tool making, the essence of speed is that uh, you're doing the same operation time after time after time. So first you do one thing to it and then you do a second operation and a third operation and so on, however many is needed. And here we see Bob putting a, an iron in the fire ready to tang it. Here he is drawing out the end of that blade to a square taper. 
he then puts it back in the fire to do the other end. And both have to be exactly alike, uh, otherwise when the finished piece is taken up to the man who actually makes the wooden spoke shave, it will not fit uh, and there are problems. Bob Pryor used to forge the spoke shave irons, his brother Charlie used to make the spoke shaves. Here we see them bending the actual tang in order to get it exactly at right angles and in line with the actual blade itself and both ends had to be parallel with one another otherwise it wouldn't fit into the wooden frame that it was about to fit. Arthur Ellis making swan necked timber scribes. That's a tool for scribing timber that's either uh, been in, in, the, in the log uh, or standing uh, in order to uh, receive some identification. Uh, here he has got a steel bar and he's made it into a, a swan neck and he's broadening out one end of it. It's known as plating. Uh, eventually that piece will be made into a gouge form and will form the cutting edge. Here we see another piece being forged in the same manner. Now you see him using his hammer upside down the reason being that the back of the hammer is soft while the face is hard and he didn't want to um, mark the chisel end. Here he is turning over the edge of the plated tool to form the gouge. He's turning it right over with the hammer and he inserts a bar of steel so that it gives it size. So it makes it an eighth of an inch thick or three sixteenths, whatever he wishes. Eventually that piece of steel will have the end cut off, formed into a tang so that a handle can be fitted. Tom Merrill worked in a little workshop in Solly Street. Uh, it started life uh, as a pen and pocket blade forger around the time of the first war and afterwards he couldn't get a job when the slump came but by the time 1939 came round he was in demand again making surgical instruments he was producing a pocket blade for us in order to show us the process as it used to go here you see a knife blade being formed on the end of a bar of steel and before your very eyes, there it is, it's grown out of that piece of steel, perfect in shape and form. He cuts it off and then he forms the tang end of this blade. That is the part that's going to fit into the handle. And before machines came to be forging blades in Sheffield, this was the traditional way that blades were always formed. You'll find that when he's generally finished forging, he lets the hammer just bounce on the anvil face. Uh, he doesn't sort of just put it down, he keeps it in his hand most of the time. Breaks it off from the piece of steel to start to form the tang again. Tom was a very good raconteur. He could tell a good tale. Coke was used for heating up the steel. And he had a pair of hand bellows, so they were hand blown. Here again we see how wonderfully each blow counts on the blade that is being formed. If you looked at the section of the steel where the blade is, 
you would see that it was wedge shaped, uh, broad on the back and thin on the cutting edge so that the grinder who has to follow the forger has a minimum amount of work to do. There were literally hundreds of different shapes and sizes of pen knife blades and pocket knife blades. And if somebody wanted just two or three dozen making, then it was, when there were plenty of men about, they were, it was far easier uh, to have them do it than produce mechanical tools to make the blades. Here we see the hardening of a pocket knife blade. In 1992, I think there is only one man left in Sheffield who is capable of forging blades of this sort. He's in actual fact a surgical instrument forger. Now Tom is producing a surgeon's scalpel. Very similar initially to a penknife blade because its shape at the business end is very, very similar indeed. But um, the handle is forged integral with the blade and I suppose it's around six or seven inches long in total. And here we see him finally smithing the blade and it will be cut off shortly. Now he's going to cut it. Break it off. And the other end goes in the fire. Now then, the back end of the handle is made into a fishtail. The idea is that when the surgeon has it in his hand, and his hands are covered in blood, uh, very slippery, he can feel whether the knife is firm in his hand because he can feel the resistance of the tail. And here is shown the range of blades that were being formed. These were the only people that I saw left doing double hand forging, in which there is a forger and a striker. The forger is the man on the left who's holding the steel. The striker is the man on the right who is wielding the 10 pound hammer. With enormous force. The first operation is to cut a piece of steel off he hammers it on top of a piece of triangular steel. It's not known as triangular steel in Sheffield, it's called three square. They keep turning the steel up and down as it is being forged. And wherever the little hammer hits, the big one follows. And they start in progression uh, along the blade, ending at the point. And they make that steel wedge shaped and apart from the point being cut diagonally, the whole shape of that blade has been formed by the hammer. The point is cut off there. He hammers it uh, on the agon to form there's the piece cut off for the handle, so you got a total length. No marks at all, no measuring, all done by eye. Here is, here is another blade being forged. They're working up and down the blade and keep turning it sideways on in order to keep an even thickness. The man who is the striker in this series, Big Harry, is now in his early 70s. Uh, he's not forging anymore, 
but he's still in, doing a few days in the cutlery trade. Very, very hard work, very demanding work. Here we see the process of making a fish knife, rather similar to making the butcher's knife, except it's very, very much heavier material. Here we see they'd marked a piece of steel and are trying to cut it in two using the, the three square piece of steel. But because it's so heavy, they're having difficulty. It's rather a good job that we didn't have sound on this film because the, the air was blue at the time. And we start off forging the point of the knife out. Just look at the work that the man on the right is giving that blade. They're taking off the scale so it's not knocked into the steel by the forging, so they retain a smooth surface. And of course, no time is lost because they were paid piecework, every second counted, and they work together in a very good team. Here we are working, seen working on the handle, making the widened end, the fishtail, very much like the previous surgeon's blade, and uh, for the same reason, because fishmongers had slippery hands and they wanted to feel that the knife was within their grasp all the time. Two leather scales would eventually be fastened to this blade. Here we are seeing the marking process. The first mark was Thomas Ellen and Company, Cutler Sheffield, trademark Vulcan, and the second mark was hand forged. This film was taken at Claywheels Lane, Claywheels Forge, Claywheels Lane in the 1940s. Um, and the scythe forger was a man called Bernard Moore. And he was third generation scythe forger. Uh, father and grandfather before him. And incidentally, he was the last generation. This shows you the interior of Claywheels Forge, very similar uh, to Abbeydale works in that one has two hammers. The left hand one is the forging hammer for forging steel and iron, and the right hand one is known as the plating hammer, which is the process of spreading the steel to make it thinner and to the correct width. This is the crocodile. The crocodile is the guillotine shear that is constantly moving up and down for cutting off the bars of iron and steel to the correct length. A scythe, crown scythe blade is a sandwich of iron and steel in which the iron forms the bread and the steel is the meat of the sandwich which forms the cutting edge uh, that's sharp but rather brittle and in order to stiffen it up whilst it's in use the raw iron is welded to it so the be the pieces of metal become as one in the initial forging process this is a fire that was very very smoky the idea being that really they didn't want the carbon to come out of the steel and uh, so that so that didn't happen they had a very smoky furnace. They rub it in sand to help with the welding process. And here you see him welding those pieces of metal together. Eventually you'll see that the end of the bars of metal are a lot thinner. They will form the tang or the part that fits onto the wooden handle of the side eventually. So what we end up with is
a long piece of steel with a, an end on it. The forgeman welds up half the metal together uh, because the tongs are around the other half. Uh, at the point known as the turn heat, the rest of the um, bar is put into the furnace, rubbed into the sand, brought out, and that in itself welded up. So one has a long piece of metal that is welded up solid, that is twice the length of a, the scythe blade. This will be cut in two. At this point, this piece of metal is known as a string. And again, you'll see that the end of the blade is reduced down to form the tang. He's just straightening the string of steel and here he is putting it on an upturned chisel and he hits it with the hammer which marks it where it has to be cut and then that mark is put into the crocodile shears and the steel is cut off. Then he has the two half pieces each of which will be plated to produce a scythe blade. Here the furnisman is rattling his fire. There are different positions within the furnace for whichever operation they are doing. A welding heat would require a very much hotter uh, steel than the plating process. You will notice that this hammerhead goes at a much slower rate than the previous one. It was very much quicker uh, for welding. The plating process seems to have a dwell so that the hammerhead stays on the scythe blade just momentarily. And what it's doing is, is moving the metal out sideways, spreading it to give the blade more width and thinner. The back is still quite thick and eventually that will have a groove put down it known as a grist. Notice how as soon as one blade is uh, taken out the other one is put under straight away. Here is the process of putting the grist in the back. It's a long groove that runs down the back of all sides and that is in order to give the blade strength uh, without increasing its weight. And this used to be done by hand by these two forgemen. After that, the blade was hardened in whale oil because uh, of the temperature that they could put the steel in at without the oil setting on fire, which with other oils was so at that time. Later, the scythe blade was ground. And that shows a series of scythe blades that was being produced by Tysaks at that time. Those short ones are known as bramble scythes. The thinner long ones were grass scythes. Perhaps one shouldn't forget that um, we used to rely on the sickle and the scythe for all our daily bread. Without it we couldn't eat. And I think that that is why Sheffield tools were so important, not only in this country, but the world over. <laughs>
by 1966, there was still one firm still producing scythes, but they were not in Sheffield. They were in Belbroughton in Worcestershire. And one day, um, an appointment was made to go and see this company making scythes uh, in the ways uh, 25 years on from the previous one. By that time, instead of having four pieces of metal welded together, two pieces of iron and two pieces of steel, uh, by this time, just one piece of steel was considered good enough. And here we see part of the producing a string. In fact, they didn't make it a long length cut into two. They made it just as one single length. But one can see the tang being uh, held by the tongs and the metal is being drawn out to length and section as required. Uh, and instead of water-driven hammers, these people are using mechanically powered hammers. Here is the newer plating process. This hammer is a mechanical form of the old water-driven hammer. They still used a wooden beam. And this man was plating out the blades. That is all he did. He didn't do the previous process, he just did the plating. And it was interesting to note, I'm talking to him, that he'd been taught his trade by Bernard Moore's grandfather, I think he said. There was a connection between the two families, the one in Sheffield and the one at Bell Broughton in Worcestershire. And when trade was bad at one place, they would go to the other to see if they could get work there. Again, you've got the very deadbeat blow, which spreads the metal sideways. You have a very quick movement by sitting on the swing seat and moving oneself about with, with uh, legs. You, one accommodates the, the length of a, even a 48 inch scythe blade very easily without moving or getting up at all, uh, reaching out to the furnace. This was the process of putting the grist in the scythe, the ribbed back, and again was done, instead of two men's wielding hand hammers, was being done by a power hammer, very deftly, very slick. Within two minutes of this film being shot, the man was drawing his fire out, it finished for the day, and again, if we hadn't have been there to, to shoot that, this would not have been recorded. After that, they are hardened in oil. Here we are, he's pulling his fire out. For, that's him for the day. After that, they go to the grinding wheel. This man is dressing his wheel with a hack hammer. He's creating a series of gashes across the wheel in order to keep the grain open. Here's the scythe grinder, a big man, pressing on with all his might. Wet, cold, dirty work. Don't think anybody would do it today. Highly skilled. Not able to talk to anybody. Just concentrate on the job in hand. The scythes are, are put in lime water after they ground and that stops them from rusting. After that, we show sickle grinding. Sickles and reaping hooks were one of the products produced at B the Bell Broughton Works. Although we don't show the forging process, here is 
a shot of sickle grinding, again showing the skill of the grinder. He stands up to get more pressure on the blade. This is Webster and Senior, Prospect Road. Makers of sickles. A trade that was practiced in Sheffield and North Derbyshire for generations. I would think at least 300 years. This is the initial process. A bar of steel is being guillotined to length in what's known as a Sheffield type press. You notice it is cut off at an angle to part form the point. After which another cut is taken to make the blade thinner at one end which will form the tang or the part on which the handle is placed afterwards. Interesting to see that the open blade being used at that time, I'm quite sure that today that wouldn't be allowed under the health and safety regulations. Here, the nose of the sickle. Most people think of the hand tool in the form of a big question mark as a sickle. In fact, the sickle is a very much lighter form of that tool, and it always has a toothed edge. It's known as being tedded in the trade. But the very much more usual, heavier tool is classed as a reaping hook, and that's what this is really, a reaping hook. And this shows the initial bend being produced on the hook it takes three bends in that forming jig. It's bending the tang end round on the anvil. And he's going to mark it. He will put that back in the fire and heat up the blade a little further round and again introduce it into the bending jig so that more of the blade is bent to shape. Again you will notice that nobody measures anything but when he compares it with one later on you find it's not far wrong. Is the point being formed. He has to keep hammering it because when he bends it in the former the blade tends to buckle as the metal is stretching on the outside and getting thicker on the inside but really he wants the inside to be thinner because that's going to form the cutting edge. So he's working, as one might say, again at nature and he's got to counteract that. The anvil he's using is a sickle maker's anvil. Like the way he lights his fag in this one. Here we see the beginning of the same process repeated, where the initial bend followed by setting down the tang. 
Interesting how they hold the hot metal. They can't pick it up by the hands. So they either hold it flat down by the hammer while they pick it up with the tongs, but somewhere or other they've got to grip it without using their own hands. This firm made hooks for most people in Sheffield at that time. It was a dying trade and whilst there were other people producing agricultural hooks, they were getting fewer and fewer. And people like Spear and Jackson, Robert Sorby and others would have their products made by this very small company, just employing four or five at the most. This is the process of tanging. When he draws out the tang, he will balance it on the head of his hammer and see how the blade hangs. There we are. Eventually the handle will be driven onto that long spike and the end clenched over so that it didn't come off again in use. He's been heating the blade up in order to harden it and he's been putting it in the hardening trough. In this case it was probably water. After which the blade went to the grinder. This is the initial grinding process, doing the edge and the point. It's interesting to see the form his hands takes while he's holding the blade being ground. how the fingers are clenched together and the pressure that's put on them. And because of the position, the grinder's working blind, as one might say, and he has to keep lifting the blade up to see how much work requires to be done on it. He sits on a big wooden block called a horsing. In the days before the turn of the century, most grinding wheels were made of sandstone and they could burst in use, in which case the grinder got crushed by the flying stone. And the big heavy wooden hosing, which was held down to the ground by chains, was an attempt in order to minimise the effects of any breaking grinding wheel. Since the turn of the century, virtually all grinding wheels are artificial except in the file grinding trade, where right to the end in 1991 at A.H. Ralston, Rockingham Street, sandstone wheels were used because they were better. After the grinding comes the glazing, which is a, a final finishing process for the blade. And in effect, it is a wheel which has a leather head or rim on it. And that rim is dressed with glue and emery and gives a finer finish to the blade than the grinding. 
This is the outside of the premises of William Marples. Their postal address was Westfield Terrace, but the works went through into the next street, known as Rockingham Street, and this is the back of the works in Rockingham Street, uh, where the plain maker's shops were situated. And the last bench plane maker to make planes by hand, quite possibly in the world, was Albert Bock, who came to William Marples just after the First World War uh, and stayed there the rest of his working life. And here we see him starting to clean out the mouth on the jack plane. He uses what he calls a sinking down gouge, a very heavy mallet, and to start off with he bores a series of holes to remove quite a bit of the waste material as much as he reasonably can, and then he starts with his gouge to remove a lot of material, and after the gouge comes the, he the heavy sinking down chisel, which I suppose really is a millwright's chisel, maybe a little bit shorter, but a very heavy one. Then he has to pair the sides of the throat. Here you see him paring down the bed, <clears throat> and it was always a push with the shoulder to actually get the forward movement of the chisel. He told me that when he went on holiday and came back, the hard patch of flesh was like a piece of raw liver for, for the first few days while he got it back into form, as you, one might say. Here he is using a, a skew chisel to clean the sides of the mouth out and more pairing of the bed. That had to be dead flat so that the plain iron sat on it. Here's the skew chisel again being used to go down the side, making the width c correct. To make the mouth, there were three small holes drilled and the mouth saw was introduced and f uh, moved first to one side and then to, to the other, after which the mouth was cleaned up with a chisel. He knew just how far to go by how far the bevel of the chisel went in. The timber for bench planes is always a very hard beech wood. The tool he was using in his left hand was a float, plane maker's float. Now he is using the cheek saw to cut out the sides where the wedges are going to fit. It seems so easy the way he does it to fetch out this wood, very hard wood, um, and to a high standard of finish. Now he's opening out the slot for the handle. <clears throat> a very thin chisel is used on both sides and he clears out the centre material 
squares up one end, the end nearest the mouth. And then the handle, which has been previously made, is then fitted. It is tapped in a tight fit and usually there's a piece has to be cleared off with the gouge and this shows Albert Bock clearing off with the gouge. The art of course is in taking off all the material but not scoring the plain stock and all it wants after that is a little cleaning up with a scraper. Now to fit the wedge. This requires to be adjusted to width. plain iron is fitted and the wedge is tapped into place. At this stage it does not project but what it does do is to turn the plane upside down and shoot the sole of the plane to ensure that it remains exactly straight and square with the sides. After that it is put with the rest of the planes. This shows the making of a beechwood moulding plane. The man who is going to make it is called Norman Bayliss, who was the last moulding plane maker at William Marples. Here he is marking out the stock of the plane so the mouth may be formed in the right place. He takes the reverse plane that he's going to make the new plane from to set the spring with a special square. Then with a pair of dividers, he marks off from the rule the distance that is required. Now he has fitted the plane stock into a what one might call a jig in order to saw the mouth. The wood that is used for moulding planes is a very, very hard beech wood, well seasoned. There are quite a number of different blocks of wood 
all to do different jobs to make the gripping of the plane easy and put it in the right position for the operations to be performed on the stock. And like everything else that an expert does, all these jobs look very, very easy. Now he's going to sink down the mouth that he is sawn out to make it go further into the stock. The chisels that he uses are mainly special ones adapted to the particular use he requires them. Now he's going to bore the hole that will eventually hold the wedge. As you can see, he guesses the angle. There's no fixed guide. And having made the round hole, he then uses his floats, which is a very coarse single cut file. And first he files uphill and then downhill. And at the same time, he's got to mate with the surface that is underneath that is cut because those two surfaces interconnect so that the iron, when it is in position, uh, is absolutely flat on the bed of the plane. Again, you see the shoulder action pushing down the chisel. Now he's running his marking gauge along the sole of the plane. And taking off the excess material. And this is actually running the new mould with the reverse plane. The reverse plane wanted a little adjustment to make it cut smoother. There he is checking it against the reverse to make sure it's deep enough.
into the vise goes another block which just grips the edge of the stock cleans out the mouth with a quite a small knife now we're back to opening out with the side floats you'll see him keep reversing the position of the float to go right and left to open it out to the scribed lines. Now the ends of the plane are paired. And placed in yet another block while he shoots the end of the plane to make it at right angles and the correct length. Rub with sandpaper. then he starts to smooth up the sides of the plane now he's forming the rebate again with a special purpose plane in order to make it slightly concave and now the top of the plane touch with a file to round off the end beveled off the end of the plane with the chisel and the file finishing off with the gouge he's rubbing on some wax And now is the process of making the wedge. Normally this is done in a sort of frame in which maybe three dozen wedges are rough sawn to shape on the circular saw bench and trapped in this framework and sawn to exact length that is required. The whole thing is tightened up so they cannot move. And then they are rounded with the jack plane. After which the groove is put in with a special purpose plane for that job. Filed up again. <laughs> 
given their final shape with the jack plane and polished. The first one and last one of these wedges will be discarded. They just serve to hold the rest together. Here is a wedge blocking the vise so that he can adjust the width of the wedge to fit the slot that is made. Now he takes the plain iron and starts to file that to shape. In this condition the plain iron is soft. It is not hardened so he can file it quite easily after which it will go away to be hardened and come back to him ready so he can wet it up. Here he is fastening the wedge in the plane so he can adjust to the exact size the cutter to the sole of the plane. A little more work on the iron. when it comes back from being hardened then it is wetted to make it very sharp. In the iron goes, the wedge is tapped in and there we are, a finished moulding plane. Here we are outside William Marple's works in Rockingham Street and the shave maker and the plane maker in the mid 1960s were working in the same workshop the shave maker at one end and the plane makers at the other this is Cyril Smith the last of the spoke shave makers or as they were termed in the trade stick makers here is his range of floats, chisels, whatever. And he starts off by having a rectangular piece of wood about 10 inches long. And from this square piece of material will turn out a tool that has no straight faces whatsoever and what to me seems a thing of beauty. The first job is to set in the iron or cutter and to do this he drills two taper holes using a very simple rotary cutter those two holes then have to be made into square holes tapered and to do this he knocks in a small drift a small piece of steel which is tapered and got teeth on it which makes the wood into square holes. It then temporarily fits in the iron and not 
scribes round it and knocks it out again. So now he knows where he can sew to make the mouth. This is a bow saw that he uses to cut the mouth out. I like to see the fluency with which he uses these tools. After he's sawn it, he cleans it off with the chisel and then files it flat. Then he has to remove two small pieces of wood in order to set in the iron so that it fits close to the shave mouth. There we are, it's been set down now. Once that has been adjusted, then really the rest of the work is cosmetic. Here is shown marking out where the handle is going to be sawn. He puts some fat on his bow saw blade and he starts to saw. Seasoned beech again, or boxwood, is the usual wood for making spoke shave. It's always interesting to see him turn the saw frame up and make that lovely curve. Now he's sharpening the draw knife. He makes a cut with the circular saw to remove waste material and he starts with the draw knife taking off most of the material that's not needed. The little bits of wood that were sawn off are now put to good use so that he can hold the tapered handles in the parallel vise they are used to make that possible. Now he's going over all the handles again with the rasp and gradually he's using a breaking down process. First the rough work with the draw knife, then the rasp gives it a lot of form, a nice oval section to the end of the handles and everything is smoothed out nicely. Still a lot of work to be done on it. You'll notice that there are no measurements. Everything is done by eye. 
Now he uses his own spokeshave. But his own spokeshave is just a piece of wood with a cutter knocked in. There's no form to it at all. Just a rough old piece of wood. But it does the job. Each end in turn gets the same treatment. These tools ceased to be made around 1965, 1966. There just wasn't enough demand for them. Files up the ends. Then he takes a steel scraper and starts to scrape each one in turn. And now sandpaper. Notice how the handle fits into the notch in the bench. examination, a tap with the hammer, the iron goes in place, and there we are, what I think is a thing of beauty. Here we see Billy Hukin, the razor grinder. He gets his blade forgings in a box, probably three dozen or six dozen at a time. Empties them on the hull floor and sorts them. From that situation, he has to grind the blade to give it form. There are something like 37 operations to finish, grind, glaze and polish an open razor. The first of these is the process of rough grinding, hollow grinding. Since the advent of the artificial grindstone, the operation of initially grinding the blade has altered. Here we see two grinding wheels running side by side and the blade is pushed between them. The grinder's left hand is working a handle which is moving the left wheel closer to the right hand one. And as it forces the blade one to another it makes the blade thinner till it gets down to the right thickness. <laughs> 
He can tell by looking at it, but he checks it. He presses the blade against his thumbnail. This enables him to judge the thickness of the blade to know whether it is of the right strength. After the initial grinding process, the blade goes through a number of other processes of which this is one. Look how quick he changes the position from one side to the other. The white on his hands is whiting. This stops the blade from going rusty. The time that is spent not actually on the wheel is considered to be lost time. So the quicker that can, the changeover can take place, the better. No open razors are now made in Sheffield anymore. One firm in Germany is still producing them and peculiarly enough quite a number are made in China. After the blade has been ground and polished it has to have its handle fitted. In Sheffield parlance this is called setting in and wetting. This is Colin Ward and he gets his blades from the razor grinder to make, put them in the handle. And what he's done here, he's got the handles in his left hand, he fitted the blade in with his right hand and he's now putting the pin in which will form the hinge. This has to be riveted on both sides. And then the blade has to go exactly down the centre of the handle. If it doesn't, it catches, of course. What he's doing now is to put two small washers onto a piece of wire. He's put the blade into the handle and the piece of wire is put through the hole in the scales and the blade and he picks up two more washers. In the cutlery trade they're not call washers, they're called revets. He knocks a piece of wire down and cuts it off and rivets it again. Watch his left hand, it's rolling round all the time. What that does is to give the rivet a nice domed head. In the old days they used to prepare razor scales, as they were known, from bone, horn, ivory, a number of natural materials and each had to be filed to shape. This is showing a similar process and then each has to have a, a hole at one end and this is done on a horizontal drill and you'll notice he's holding it with his left hand and his knee is pushing his hand so the drill goes forward into the scale. The little washers that are called rivets are produced from some material that's called latin. It's very thin nickel silver sheet and in the cutler has a special punch which makes a hole in the centre and cuts the outside all in one go. This is done on a piece of lead and he picks the little washers or rivets as they're called out and into his apron. They then go into his rivet box.
which is a small box with perforated metal in the top to allow the wire to poke through. There's the operation again. Done so quickly, the eyes can hardly see. And look what he's using for a hammer. A file. Clip. And that tiny hammer, just the right weight to spread the head of the rivet and no more. In days when scales were made of pearl and ivory, they had to be very careful so as not to split the material. Now we're coming up to the final processes. This is known as wetting, putting the very final edge on. little oil, a very fine stone. This one is called Belgian rock. A wipe. There it is, Sheffield blade. Touch with the strop. And a test. Another wipe. Into its little bag. There's the finished article.